Alright guys, hello everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I've never given a talk exactly like this before. Nothing as scholarly. It's always just been kind of edgy atheist stuff. But this is, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to do something like this. But I, I understand that this kind of stuff can be really dry and boring. So I decided uh, that I'm gonna I'm gonna throw some cool stories in here to make it much better. Uh, watch the camera, little man. <laughs> okay. Uh, so about ten years ago, I first got on YouTube. Uh, very soon after its its launch. And the first thing I saw was a lot of videos between Christians and atheists pretty much debating. And it was the greatest thing I had ever seen. And people don't really care about it too much, but I really have, there's a, there's a spot in my heart that longs for those days. But there was something I didn't see a lot of. It was actually changing of minds. It was actually common ground. This kind of stuff you didn't see, it was just creationists and atheists talking about whether or not God used magic or whether or not evolution was a thing. Uh, and there was some success because it brought secularism and atheism to the forefront and it really made it known to people that we're here too. We're also people and we work in the same fields as you do and we're, we're just as much human and we should also be taken seriously. Uh, one of the things that I never saw get discussed was anything about history. The only history stuff I saw was really bad mythicism that people took from the movie Zeitgeist. But I think actual history can, uh, can remedy that. I think actually looking at the evidence and looking at what happened in the past can help us understand the Bible way more and understand why it's wrong way more. Uh, I'm not going to concentrate too much on why it's necessarily wrong, but I am going to tell some stories that show it's not exactly what it seems. That I think if I were a Christian, this would cause a lot of problems for me and if I had any kind of faith whatsoever. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, since this subject is really boring, I'm going to be talking about textual criticism and really old manuscripts, really dry stuff. But there are some really fantastic manuscripts that are really <coughs> amusing that I want people to know. So there are two uh, manuscripts that suffer from the same mistake. It's a minuscule 80 and minuscule 109. Uh, and for the purposes of this, it doesn't really matter what minuscule means, it's just a manuscript. Uh, the scribe who was writing down these manuscripts, what he initially had was, and it wasn't by the same guy, but two different scribes, two different time periods, but they made the same mistake. So usually, how do you guys read columns? You read one all the way down and then the other one, right? right. Well, this guy didn't. He was very lazy. Uh, so they were it straight across. So, and, and the part that they were doing this on was the genealogy in Luke. So everybody had the wrong father. And it was really funny, because God was the son of Aram, and the source of the human race wasn't God, it was fairies. <laughs> Absolutely ridiculous. And they just passed over it completely. And since we know how long it actually is, we can tell how many columns there initially were, and the exact mistake this guy made. So that's really the only interesting, or the, or the only really funny manuscript I could find, because there's no comprehensive list of hilariously atrocious manuscripts. So that's the only, those are the only ones I can bring up, and they suffer from the same mistake. Uh, so there were two ways that were mistakes were made, or two main ways. There were the accidental mistakes, uh, things like hearing things incorrectly, or just uh, copying them down wrong, really tiny mistakes. And then there were the intentional ones. And the intentional ones are the really big ones. And I just want to point this out first. The accidental ones, 
most of them, 99% of them, don't matter. They don't even matter a little bit to the theology. It's just stuff like misspelling, misspellings and grammar mistakes. Uh, really not much. It's nothing. Maybe like some wording changes to say something else, but it doesn't really change anything too much. So I just want to point out that 99% of these mistakes really don't matter, at least the accidental ones. So first, on the accidental ones, uh, and actually, can I get that, uh, the, the board? Oh, sure. yeah, yeah, because I would have shown this, but I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> So, as in English, uh, we do have some letters that look similar, right? And if somebody has astigmatism or bad eyesight in general, they can mix them up. And that's perfectly reasonable. Uh, what most of these mistakes go to show is that people in the past couldn't read or write any better than we could now. Well, what, what was the alphabet of the original Bible or Bibles? Uh, the, so the New Testament was originally written in Greek and uh, parts of it in Aramaic. So there are four letters here. So I'm just going to call down first. Let's see. And okay. So sigma, omicron, theta, and epsilon. Now. These would get confused a lot. And you might be looking at these on the end and be like, how could you possibly confuse those? These were usually, in shorthand, written kind of like this, <laughs> with a with lunar, uh, actually, I don't know if this one was written exactly like that. I'm probably messing that up. Uh, but they were kind of written like this. I think there were curves on the end here. So this is what's called lunar like style, because obviously you guys get it, self-explanatory. Uh, so scribes would often mix these up. Uh, for example, in uh, Acts 20.35, there are three manuscripts that uh, mix it up. So the exact reading is, in everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. That's what it initially said, but the words First of all, these manuscripts were written in something called scriptio continua, which means no punctuation, no spaces, nothing. And no camel cases? No, no, not, not for these manuscripts. Uh, so people would often, if this was on the end of a letter, for example, people would often mistake it for the beginning of, or sorry, if this was the end of the word, people would often mistake this as the beginning of the next one. So they would mess things up. Uh, one, of the, and the funny, and the, one of the funny ones here is because of this, this kind of mistake, the word uh, seeing became crushed. So instead, the text read, in everything I did, I crushed you. <laughs> so then these kinds of mistakes don't really matter. And we can tell exactly what they did. Because in the Greek, we can see that the letters on the, uh, at the end of one word and the beginning of another look really similar, so we can definitely tell how they messed up. Another one was called to hear. Uh, a lot of the time, uh, scribes would dictate their letters to their servants or their helpers, uh, people who work for them, stuff like that. Uh, and as in English, they also had words that sound exactly the same, but have different meanings, like there, there, and there. And none of you have any idea in what order I said that. <laughs> so one of the interesting ones that is still up for debate, and it's unclear if it actually matters or not. That's what the debate's about. Uh, Galatians 4.28, Paul says, now you, brothers and sisters, like Isaac, are children of promise. Uh, the, the issue is with the word you, because in ancient Greek, the word you and the word we sounded exactly the same. So it's unclear if Paul included himself as one of these children of promise. Uh, and modern Bibles actually differ on the correct translation. So they, they pick whichever one suits their needs. 
Uh, then there are other kinds of errors that are kind of accidental and intentional. Imagine you're a scribe in the ancient world, and you have a manuscript that you think contains a mistake. Sometimes, with all good intentions, they would try to correct the mistake. And sometimes they would get it wrong. So you have the initial manuscript, the mistake, and then the mistake trying to correct the mistake. So it was all well intentioned, but this kind of mistake happened quite a bit when scribes had the best intentions but didn't know any better. So one of the examples here is uh, Revelations 1-4. From him who is and who was and who is to come. So the words, uh, and boy, I wish I could show the Greek here. Uh, the initial words are the, God, and Lord. And it comes in right at the very beginning. And because of how weird this verse is, all three are present in manuscripts. You have the, the initial one, whichever one it may be, uh, probably uh, the is the initial one. And then you have a mistake, and then somebody is trying to correct the mistake. But, so, but all three readings are present in the manuscripts. Then there are what, and I really wish you could have seen this because there's a good pun here. It's uh, marginal errors. And the reason it's funny is because they are scribes that wrote things in the margins. Thank you, I'm here all night. So, <laughs> so oftentimes, the scribes would write notes in the manuscript they were copying. And usually this was just to help their readers understand things better, or to help the preacher understand things better when they were doing their sermons. This was called the lectionary tradition. Uh, sometimes these notes would actually make it into the text, because a later scribe would be looking at this lectionary, uh, or this marginal note, and say, oh, this should be in here. And then when they copied it down, they would include the marginal note. Uh, this happened, for example, in Romans 8.1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But some manuscripts contain the marginal note actually put in right afterwards. Who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So a scribe added that in to help his readers understand something, but then a later scribe decided to throw it right into the text. This belongs here. Then we get into the intentional changes. Now these are some of the big ones. I'm going to go over two really big ones at the end of this. So hopefully you're not bored out of your minds. <laughs> so the first kind of intentional error is a harmonistic corruption. So the scribes copying these down knew the Bible really well. They knew it almost word for word. It was their life. So sometimes when they read something in one gospel that didn't really match to another gospel they were reading, they would go back to the initial gospel they were reading and change something. They would add something in and make it harmonized. For example, John 19.20, many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and the sign was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. In a lot of manuscripts, and in fact I think most Bibles, uh, Luke 23.38 contains one of these corruptions. So Luke 23.38, there was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. But then a scribe would come in later and write in, it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. Something that wasn't initially in the text, they would add that in because they were trying to harmonize what they were writing. Uh, another kind of one of these intentional but accidental, uh, sorry, past that. Another one of these intentional mistakes is adding co complementary phrases. When a scribe would feel like a verse didn't really say as much as it could say, they added things in to kind of make it align with the other stuff they read, make it align with their already existing theology. So Matthew 9.13, for I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. A lot of manuscripts, 
a lot of modern Bibles include at the end of that, unto repentance. And they took that from Luke 5.32. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So when a scribe who had already read Luke was copying down Matthew, they would add in this complimentary phrase. And then there's conflation of readings. Now this is a really interesting one because this was really common in Hebrew uh, scribal traditions. But it also showed up a little bit in uh, New Testament studies, or in, in New Testament scribal traditions. So when a scribe came across two manuscripts and couldn't decide which one was the correct reading, he would often put them together. So Luke 24, 53, the first initial reading that a scribe would have seen was, and they stayed continually at the temple blessing God. And then a second reading would have said, and they stayed continually at the temple praising God. But then a scribe, not knowing which one is the original or which one to cut, seeing that they both hold theological uh, implications, says, and they stayed continually at the temple praising and blessing God. And that is in actually most modern Bibles. Then we get to the big stuff, the theological changes, the ones that were specifically meant to combat other views. In the 1930s, there was someone named Walter Bauer, a German scholar. Up until that point, everybody thought that early Christianity was mostly a orthodoxy, or at that time a proto-orthodoxy, and then it was kind of mingled with these Gnostic and heretical groups, just a little bit of those. But Walter Bauer published this amazing book called Orthodoxy and Heresy in Early Christianity, and it flipped the scholarly world on its head. He demonstrated that, in fact, it was the other way around, that it was mostly heretical and Gnostic groups, and then the proto-orthodoxy was a relatively small slice of the Christianity pie. When, when, when we know this knowledge now, we go back into the text and check for how someone could have manipulated it to specifically go against their opponents. And this happened a lot. Pretty much everything in the Bible, or in the New Testament at least, was a way to get against their opponents. Pretty much everything in one way or another. So one of the views, for example, is uh, one of these heretical views is adoptionism. So the adoptionists believe that God adopted Jesus at his baptism. So when, uh, in Mark, when Jesus is getting baptized, a dove comes down from heaven and Jesus hears a voice that said, you are my son, today I have begotten you. So he wasn't the son of God before. He was adopted by God at his baptism. And now that's a heretical view. But in order to combat this, there were scribes that in the very beginning of Mark, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the initial reading being the beginning of the gospel, uh, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that was initially the beginning. But they added the Son of God. So already they are combating these, these views that they find radical, that they don't like, that they disagree with. Another example is uh, docetism. Dose, uh, docetism comes from the Greek word dokeo, meaning to appear. They believed that Jesus wasn't a real person. They believed that he was an illusion, a phantasm. They thought that the flesh was evil, that it was wicked, so there is no way a righteous, holy being like Jesus could have come in the flesh. So they thought that he came as a phantasm. And this is also a heretical view. Uh, for example, in uh, Luke 22, 43-44, we read, An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him, and being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Those two verses do not exist in ancient manuscripts. Really old ones. Like, our earliest ones, they just do not exist. Now, the reason this was included by opponents of docetism was because how can you be in anguish when you don't have a body? So they threw in anguish. They threw in a, a lot of a lot of heat. This is a very heated scene here. 
and they said that his sweat was like drops of blood falling on the ground. So he has sweat too. How could this being just appear as a real person and have sweat? So obviously, he must be a real person. This is the kind of reasoning they have. This is the kind of scribal changes that happen specifically on the basis of theology. Then there are forgeries, and I wish you could see this whole thing here, but there are a lot of forgeries in the Bible, a lot. A lot of writers uh, would write things in somebody else's name. Now usually this, something like this is called pseudepigrapha, but pseudepigrapha just means like writing inscribed with a lie. It's a forgery. This is somebody claiming to be somebody else to push their own views. Like, for example, if you're a relatively unknown person, like I am, would I rather publish under my own name or under J.K. Rowling's? Which one do you think is more likely to have people uh, buying the book off the shelves? Pretty sure the J.K. Rowling one, right? So that was the same thought that the, uh, these people in the ancient world had. For example, out of all of Paul's letters, seven of them are real and six of them are forgeries. They were written in Paul's name to push theological agendas, to portray the views they wanted to push. So, for example, we have the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. We know those are forgeries because this kind of hierarchy, because they're, they're writing to the, because uh, the author is writing to the heads of the churches, uh, that kind of hierarchy didn't exist in Paul's day. Not even a little. That's why he was always writing to the people of the church, the Romans, the Corinthians, the Galatians. He wasn't interested in writing to any church fathers or any pastors because the hierarchy didn't exist yet. Uh, and then there's Ephesians, uh, Colossians, and 2 Thessalonians. Those are also the four trees, and I won't bore you with all the nitty gritty there. Uh, then Hebrews doesn't actually claim to be by Paul, but it's obvious that the author probably wants you to think he's Paul. So that's kind of in the, the pseudo-Pauline section. And then for the rest of the book, uh, there are four more direct forgeries. There's James, 1st and 2nd Peter, and Jude. Those are all forgeries claiming to be by people they are not. Uh, and then there's, and I forget the exact word for this, but 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelations were all written by somebody named John. But we don't know if it's the same John from, we don't know if it's John, son of Zebedee, the guy who according to Christianity, wrote the, the Gospel of John. By the way, it couldn't have possibly been him, but that's for another time. Uh, so these people probably had just the same name. They probably just shared a name. Uh, and then we get to the big stuff. So how many of you have heard the story of Jesus and the woman taken in adultery? Raise your hands. And Jesus and the woman taken in adultery. Okay. Yeah, so it's a very famous story. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees go up to Jesus, seeking to entrap him. They present him with a woman that has committed adultery. And they pretty much say, what are you going to do about it? Now, this is a trap. Because if Jesus punishes her, then he is going against his forgiving nature. But if... Jesus says stone her or condemn her in some way, then he is going against the law of Moses. So this is a trap. But Jesus, thinking on his feet, comes up with an amazing solution to this <laughs> and says pretty much what boils down to let he who is without sin cast the first stone. That's how we know it colloquially. Which is kind of like a summation of what he actually said. But the interesting part is this story, has an, this story has a fascinating history, because it doesn't exist in our oldest manuscripts. The f earliest manuscript that contains this story is at, uh, probably dates to around the year 400 in Codex Bizet. Uh, this, this story had an evolution, though. And we can see it from the patristic evidence that something like this was circulating. So I'm going to uh, read off some of these. Of things here. So in his ecclesiastical history, uh, Eusebius uh, quotes a story known to him through the writings of Capius of Herodotus, someone that uh, someone that lived in the late first century, early second century. 
The same person, Papias, uses proofs from the first epistle of John and from the epistle of Peter in like manner. And he also gives another story of a woman who was accused of many sins before the Lord, which is found in the gospel according to the Hebrews. So this is a very, this, this story show, uh, shares vague similarities to uh, Jesus and the woman taking adultery. By the way, uh, the story of Jesus and the woman taken in, uh, in adultery has its very own name, Pericope Adultery, uh, because it has had so much research and so much scholarship on it that they're just like, screw it, we'll give it its own title too. What happened to the man? That's what I want to know. What? Well, oh, they have another man. Yeah, yeah. what happened to the man? Him. <laughs> no, the, they're, they're strangely silent on that. So. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then in the third century, we get the Didascalia Apostolorum. This is the teachings of the apostles. Now, this was a later forgery. Uh, it was initially meant to, uh, it was initially claiming to be written by the apostles, but because we're smarter than they are, we have figured out that no, it was a layer of forgery. But in, in this writing, they say, and when the elders had set another woman which had sinned before him, Jesus, and had left the sentence to him and were gone out, our Lord, the searcher of hearts, inquiring of her whether the elders had condemned her, and being answered, no, he said unto her, Go thy way, uh, therefore, for neither do I condemn thee. This Jesus, O ye bishops, our Savior, our King, and our God, ought to be set before you as your pattern. This story shares a lot more similarities, but it still contains some differences. For example, it says that uh, the elders brought her forth. When in the Pericope Adultere, it's the scribes and the Pharisees, the greatest enemies of Jesus. Uh, this doesn't say that it's specifically adultery. This just says some random sin. And then in his commentary on Ecclesiastes, Didymus the Blind, living in the mid-fourth century, uh, tells a story even more similar. We find, therefore, in certain Gospels, the following story. A woman, it says, was condemned by the Jews for a sin, and was being sent to be stoned in the place where that was customary to happen. The Savior, it says, when he saw her and observed that they uh, were ready to stone her, said to those who were about to cast stones, He who has not sinned, let him take a stone and cast it. If anyone is conscious in himself not to have sinned, let him take up a stone and smite her. And no one dared, since they knew in themselves and perceived that they themselves were guilty in some things, they did not dare strike. Now this is even closer to when we actually have manuscript evidence for this story, and it shares way more similarities, but it still shares really distinct differences. For example, in the Pericope Adultery, the scribes and the Pharisees bring the woman to Jesus, but in this story, he just kind of stumbles upon her. Uh, so this story had a clear evolution. <clears throat> now, if we want to actually figure out if this story is original, we can look at something that other church fathers were saying about it. For example, Tertullian, he wrote an entire book called On Modesty. It was a treatise on adultery and, well, modesty. In it, he references a lot of biblical passages that discuss how one should conduct themselves. He makes no mention of this story. And you would think that an entire treatise devoted to adultery would include the pericope adultery, but it doesn't. So let's talk about the creation of the story. Why did it come up in the first place? Well, as Eusebius mentioned, Papias quoted that it came from the Gospel uh, of the Hebrews. Now this was an Ebionite text, and the Ebionites were a, and I have a good definition here, uh, a group of Jewish Christians who either were born Jewish or converted to Judaism who kept Jewish customs and strictly followed the Jewish laws, circumcision, uh, circumcision, Sabbath observance, kosher food, etc. But who believed that Jesus was the Messiah of God. More specifically, they taught, uh, they thought that Jesus had been the most righteous man on earth and because of his righteousness was adopted by God to be his son when he was baptized. So this was uh, the Ebionite group. And it makes perfect sense if it was there. So the, the Ebionite uh, Gospel, we don't actually have the Gospels, uh, the Gospel to the Hebrews anymore, that's a lost text. But we do know from patristic evidence that it was a Ebionite text. 
And the Ebionites didn't, they, they portrayed the wrong view of Jesus. The proto-Orthodoxy uh, was very much into the polemics game. They really liked to shit talk all other beliefs. Uh, <laughs> they really liked to argue a lot, like, like a YouTube atheist, like me. Uh, so they, they pretty much deemed this uh, gospel heretical, and it was never mentioned again, but the story was good. They liked the story, so they took parts of this story because it showed Jesus' kind nature and his reverence for uh, the laws of Moses. But there was, one, there was one interesting part of the story that people seem to pass over. It's the part where Jesus writes on the ground. And this is incredibly important. So back in that time, in the, third, in the late uh, third century, there was a lot of pagan criticism. The pagans were saying stuff like, ah, our gods can actually write. They actually have this ability. Your god seems to be illiterate. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. So, so they threw in this story, this part of the story, and it's really crucial. There is, because it says specifically that Jesus wrote on the ground with his finger. And that's really critical. Because the only other character in the Bible to write anything with his finger is God when he is writing the Ten Commandments. So this was obviously meant to parallel the Moses tradition. When an ancient reader would see this, that Jesus was writing on the ground, they would immediately think of God writing the Ten Commandments with his finger. Because, and this demonstrates that Jesus is not only uh, a person, uh, he's not only a deliverer of the law, he is the arbiter of it. He is the writer of it. He is the author of it. So it was incredibly important to throw in that piece about Jesus writing on the ground with his finger. Now, there was a lot of stuff in John. But by the way, this entire story can be found in other Gospels throughout time. Sometimes it appears in Luke, in different places in Luke. Sometimes it appears in John, where it is, and then sometimes it appears in John in other parts. And that was probably due to the lectionary tradition. Depending on what you wanted to cover, you would put the story somewhere else in your writing, so you remembered it for that, uh, for that lecture. So it pops up in a lot of places. But it ended up in what makes the most sense, uh, in, in the Gospel that makes the most sense, because throughout the entire Gospel of John, Jesus is paralleling Moses. And every single time, he is shown to be better. For example, John 1.17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 9.28, Then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. Every single time, Jesus is shown to be superior to Moses. Another one, and this is probably one of the biggest ones, is the Johannine comma. Do you guys know what that is, the Johannine comma? So, it is the only place in the Bible that explicitly outlines the Trinity Doctrine. It's the only place where they're actually straight up telling you these three are one. So it occurs in 1 John 5.78. <coughs> Sorry, 5.78. For there are three that bear record in heaven. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I should have had some water today. For there are three that bear record, and then this is the part that was added in. In heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, and there are three that bear witness in earth, and that's the end of the addition, but then it continues, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, we agree in one. So, that part in the middle there is the Johannin Kama. It's the only place where the Trinity Doctrine is explicitly outlined, and it was put in there in the 15th century, or I think 16th, maybe. Uh, so as the story goes, there was this theologian, Erasmus, and he was going to publish the first Greek uh, New Testament because the printing press had just been invented. He was going to be the first one to publish it. And when, when he gathered his manuscripts, by the way, he was using bad manuscripts. He was using 9th century manuscripts at the earliest. So when he was, oh, oh thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't stand up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
us that. <laughs> So the, the other theologians, the other uh, priests and bishops, they were pretty mad at him for not including anything about the uh, Trinity. So he said that he couldn't find any manuscript that actually had anything about the Trinity doctrine. So he said that if, if you could show me a Greek manuscript that contains this, I will gladly add it. So instead of being honest, they produced one. They produced a Greek manuscript with this edition just so Erasmus could add it into his publication. And they did. And that text was called the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. And this text and its later uh, republications uh, were the basis for the King James Version. That's why I always say the KJV is the worst possible version. It's based on bad manuscripts. It contains all the stuff that we know wasn't original. And it doesn't even tell you that it doesn't that uh, there's like a shady gray area for that stuff. Like most modern Bibles tell you, like, for example, the, the, the second ending of Mark. They tell you, oh, this this did, didn't exist in many early manuscripts. They tell you for the, the Pericope Adultery even, like, oh, this didn't exist in really early manuscripts. Like, they let you know that it wasn't there. KJV, nothing of the sort. <laughs> so I actually have uh, a video on my channel called The Brief History of the Trinity. Uh, it's about half an hour. That's about as brief as I can make it. <laughs> and I, I talk about this in depth. So if you guys want to check that out, feel free to do so. So then we're left with the question of the original text. Is there any way we can actually recover an original text to the Bible? Until we discover new manuscripts, there is probably no way to do it. We do have methods. We do have methods of figuring out which text is a better reading. We look at the patristic evidence. We also, <clears throat> one of the interesting ways, and it's kind, of, um, it's kind of a weird way of doing this, but it seems to, to work, what we do is we have, if we, if we have two manuscripts, and one of them makes less sense than the other in context. They both make like grammatical sense and stuff, but one makes less sense theologically, and then the other one makes more sense theologically. One of the things we do is, it, see, it usually means that the text that makes less sense is the original. Because are you, are you more likely to change something that doesn't make sense into something that does? or something that does make sense into something that doesn't. You're more likely to change something that doesn't make sense into something that does. So we know that the weird one is most likely the original, but that's not, that's not the only way we do it, but that is a method. We do have ways of cross-checking these things. But the question of the original text, and if we can recover it, it's possible, but we probably need to find more manuscripts that are really old. Thank you.